So let's, let's start by relating the book to uh, the exhibition. The, the exhibition, which is just upstairs here, is it seems to me about a journey that we're all on, a journey to belong in this country. And d as you come in the, into the exhibition there, there's an interpretative panel on the wall that says, among other things, that this is uh, an exhibition about the friction between nature, culture, and history. And those are three great elements to juggle with, and I think that's what I'm going to try and talk about in this, in this half hour. It really does present us with an opposition that I think we have in our hearts as Australians, especially as um, those of us who are settler Australians. On the one hand, you've got those very rich pictures of, of life, life in close-up, the uh, Douglas Holili's uh, bottle brush bush or the, the, well, you've seen them all, those lovely pictures of nature caught in, in vivid, um, uh, you know, vividly with pulsing with life. But against it, of course, there are lots of pictures of desolation, of alienation or of kind of black humour, photographs of, you know, rotting cars or of desolate landscapes of Lake George presented to us as a puzzle. Now, everything that's revealing, everything that is dynamic about a culture comes out of its contradictions. You know, we talk about Australians too often as though we all believe the same thing, as though there's an Australian ethos, and it goes all the way back to the convicts or to the gold miners or to the Anzacs or some, somewhere or other. Of course, that's nonsense. Australian culture is always, like all cultures, a conversation. And you understand who a people are by understanding the things that they argue about. Even the things they argue about in their own souls. What are our conflicts? And this conflict that we all live with, well, settler Australians live with, between the sense that we belong here and the sense that somehow we don't, really is at the heart of what it means to be an Australian at the moment in this struggle, the struggle to belong here. Now, what I want to explore with you over this half hour is that the concept of nature is important here. Because in some ways, the photographs up there represent, some of them do, represent what I guess a European would say is an absence of nature. A place where nature isn't. Of a place that's desolate, that's dry, that's abandoned. Now maybe we as Australians are starting to think differently, but if you come in with a European eye, you'd say, well, there's not a lot going on here. There's not a lot of nature on show here. So I want to just explore that concept of of nature. So I've called the, the talk lost in nature, the idea that settler Australians are lost in nature. And this is a place I know very well. It's called Whittenham Clumps and it's in England. And I lived in a village that's uh, a short walk from those clumps uh, when I was 17. I lived there for a year and I spent many broody hours as a mooching adolescent on top of those clumps looking out over Oxfordshire that way and Berkshire that way and reflecting on who I was in the great scheme of things. Now, there's been a lot of archaeology done at Whitnam Clumps, and human occupation there goes back to the Bronze Age, which is about a thousand years before Christ in England. In the Iron Age, there were earthworks uh, added around the bottom to the foot of the hills uh, to make it a fortification, and there was a, a, a settlement that lived up there behind the fortification. The people here ate fish. We know that because the archaeological record shows they ate fish, which was caught in the Thames, and the Thames runs behind us. Uh, we, the photographer, which is me, has got his back uh, to the Thames. Um, people have written poems about the clumps. In fact, there's a poem inscribed uh, actually on, on, on a stone up there among the trees. So there's poetry written into the place. There have been many famous paintings uh, painted there. This is uh, Paul Nash, one of the great 20th century painters, who was obsessed with Whitnam Clumps, painted it again and again. Now, no one would ever suggest that this place should be restored to its natural condition. Because what on earth would that mean? When you stand at Whitnam Clumps, nature and farming and human occupation are all of a piece. If you go on a nature walk in Europe, you expect along the way to pass through farming country because farming is part of nature. But in Australia, nature stops at the farm gate. Nature's what's outside the farm. Now, there are a lot of farmers that disagree with that, enlightened farmers, but in the dominant culture, farming is about claiming the farm from nature. 
And this is not a bad thing. This is to do with who we are. We came to a country that was covered in bush. And we had to wrestle with that in order to um, install the kind of technology, the kind of farming practices, the kind of cities that we wanted. So our forebears, I'm talking about settler forebears, saw nature as a challenge. And that was an appropriate way to think then, but it's not an appropriate way to think now. Now, on the other side, there is this idea that we should conserve nature, that we should leave it pristine, because if you let people in, they'll stuff it up. We have, in our paradoxical way, a belief that if we build things, that will spoil the environment. So we don't want building to go on. But this is one of my favourite places in the world. It's the Pont du Gard, a great bridge uh, aqueduct in, in France. And Again, that time I lived in, in, in England when I was 17, I went to France and I swam down there and three times in my life now I've swum under that bridge. And it's a wonderful experience looking up at this cathedral-like structure built by a Roman to carry water 15 kilometres from a little spring up in the mountains down a very, very gradual slope down into the, um, the, 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 the town of Nîmes, which was an early... Roman settlement. It, this is the technology that irrigated Roman civilization, the aqueducts. I bet when that was built, some of you were opposed to it, the Black Mountain Tower in, in Canberra. I thought it was appalling that it was going to be built, absolutely appalled. But now I can't imagine Canberra without it. I love it. When I come into Canberra on an aeroplane and I see it there, I think, <laughs> That is such a wonderful structure to be standing on, on the top of that hill. Now, two years ago now, I went on a cruise around, uh, in the Kimberley and um, as part of this cruise, we went to this... this uh, we went ashore and went to this um, cave painting site. Um, and I'm assured that we, ha we have permission to be there and we have permission to photograph. I'm confident about that. And that central Wangina figure right in the middle of the photograph is actually the actual figure on which the Wangina figure was based that was in the Sydney Olympics. That, that Wangina figure is the model for that very famous figure that was in the middle. And I had a profound experience there. I was, I was on this cruise because... Uh, it was a bunch of rich Americans, to be frank with you, and I was there as what they called a resource. A guy rang me and said, I've seen you on the television, you'd make a marvellous resource. <laughs> I was supposed to be flattered. Anyway, I agreed to be a resource and I went with these people and um, as we stood in this cave, and the Americans all duly took photographs of everything, I got quite emotional and I thought, I don't know really what this is about, th these one genie figures. But I feel that they're part of my story. In a way, they're not part of the American story. And the Americans weren't being disrespectful. They were, they were great. But they will go home. This is not their place, but it is my place. And I don't want to intrude on anybody's dreaming here. I'm not trying to appropriate anybody's story here. But we were invited to go there. We were told they were. So I'm wrestling with this. I'm not telling you what we should do, what we should not. I'm just saying part of me is saying, I want to understand this. I want to believe that somehow I can know more about what it means to be an Australian by getting closer to whatever this is all about. Now these are the random thoughts that are in my mind that I'm kind to draw together when I write the book The Water Dreamers. My sense that somehow we can make meaning settler Australians out of being here. That we can get beyond this kind of statement which came from as you can see, there's a book by Earl Cox. It's a science fiction book. This was Australia, says one character. The land without a history. The one country in the world without a past. I was in Oxford uh, a few years ago at dinner uh, at an Oxford college, very grand occasion. And this woman leant forward and she said to me, so what do I actually do in Australia? I said, I'm a historian. She said, yeah. You can't be very busy. <laughs> now, it's a good joke, 
But it's also an ignorant joke. It's a really ignorant joke. Because the truth is that the human history of Australia is 40,000 years old. And it, when we settler Australians say that, it can sound a bit pious. But I wonder whether we can really get to the point where we believe that our history as Australians is 40,000 years old, our history. Because if you can't say that, then you don't really believe that Aborigines are Australians. You believe that something really fundamental, a fundamental breach happened 200 years ago. I would like to believe that we can live in an Australia where Indigenous Australians and non-Indigenous Australians can agree on the principle that we have a history that is 40,000 years old. Now, I'm aware of all the cultural problems that that carries with it, some notion of eliminating difference or sanitising the past, and I'm not trying to do any of that. I'm saying if we're going to go forward, in the end, I believe we need to be able to say that. You know, we talk about Aborigines, white Australians talk about Aborigines as though this sense of spirituality they have is weird, whether we think it's ridiculous or we think it's um, beautiful. You know, the idea that every river has a story, that there are spirits that live in the land, that every, every mountain has, has a yarn. We talk about Aborigines as though that's, that's an unusual quality they have, but it's not unusual. It's what human cultures do. It's what human cultures do. The unusual people in this story are settler Australians who are still learning to write these stories because we've only been here for this short time. But Europe is a place, Asia is a place where every river has a story, where every bend in the road has a tale, where trees have names. Aborigines is not weird in this. It's just what humans do. And, and you know, the, the, the scepticism that some people have about Aboriginal sense of spirituality is really odd because they're just doing the human thing. Now, here's William Howard, a lovely man. He was a Quaker who came to Australia in the 1850s basically to check out the gold rush. This is what he wrote. Australia is one huge unreclaimed forest. <laughs> he hadn't been to the centre. The immense quantity of vegetable matter rotting on the surface of the earth and still more rotting in the waters, which the new visitant must drink, cannot be healthy. All these evils, the axe, the plough and the fire of the settlers will eventually remove. And when it is done, I do not believe there will be a more healthy country on the globe. Now, this really is a fundamental idea in 19th century Australia, that we will bring the arts of civilization to the country and bring it to life, that there actually is no nature here, or that if there is nature, it's unhealthy. That what we need to do is to bring the arts of civilization. And one of the great advocates of this was Major Mitchell, who saw the land as a place that lacked art that it was in a, in a kind of pre-natural state. Now, one of the things I've talked about in The Water Dreamers is, is the way in which this attitude that there was no nature, that there was nothing here to protect, led to the destruction of the tank stream. There's the tank stream reduced to a terrible sewer. And that, that story is played out again and again throughout the country. I find my, my, my time's going so much quicker than I meant it to, so I'm, I'm going to jump forward. A key idea in the Water Dreamers is this. The settlers arrived with a sense of optimism about Australia. They believed that somewhere there would be great rivers, that somewhere there would be great farmlands. But what happened is they reached a point in the centre of Australia where the land said thus far and no further. And what drove them back was dryness. What drove them back was a lack of water. The aridity of Australia was a huge affront to Australian sense of who they were and what they might become. When the Americans headed west, they journeyed into the Great Plains and a land opened before them with, in all its bounty. And the Americans declared, we are a people with a manifest destiny. God has meant us to come upon all this bounty. But when we went inland, what we found was a manifest joke, manifest disappointment, a land that drove us back. And we end up with this struggle to make sense of the fact that the centre of Australia is dry. And there are many responses. One is to embrace melancholy. And this is Barcroft Boak. 
Now, Mark Rove Boke was a young Sydney man who went droving up in Queensland and he wrote that famous poem, Where the Dead Men Lie. Out on the wastes of the Never Never, that's where the dead men lie. That's where the heat waves dance forever, that's where the dead men lie. That's where the earth's love suns are keeping endless tryst, not the west wind sweeping, feverish pinions can wake their sleeping out where the dead men lie. Where brown summer and death have mated, that's where the dead men lie. Loving with fiery lust unsated, that's where the dead men lie. Out where the grinning skulls bleach whitely, under the salt bush sparkling brightly, out where the wild dogs chorus nightly, that's where the dead men lie. Now, generations of school children were invited to read that poem as though it was a great Australian poem. That's a poem that arises from a very unhealthy state of mind. That is a man who is in mental torment. It's about alienation and despair, and he's finding meaning of life in suicidal longings. And on Folly Point, here on Sydney Harbour, he tied his stock, rope into a, stock whip into a noose, threw it over a she-oak, and he hanged himself. And yet this idea that death and annihilation and emptiness are part of who we are is a really powerful idea. Explorer after explorer went out into the desert and said it's a place of death-like silence. And really this, this fact that we say venerate, venerate Burke and Wills, you know, who died out there in the silence, is all about making a nationalism out of death, out of silence, out of annihilation. I call this necro-nationalism, a nationalism based on death. Now, there we are, there's poor old Wills, a necro-nationalist hero based on death. I'm going to whiz through these because I don't have... Oh, well, I could say this. Now, there were, there were several people who tried to defy this pessimism. One is a group of painters. Here's Von Girard's famous picture of Mount Kosciuszko, which he said was a glimpse of divine poetical feelings. And you see there's a little guy there down on a rock. Can you just see him down there about a third of the way along from the left-hand side, dwarfed by the, the enormity of of the rock. The art critics call this, this kind of painting the romantic sublime and of course it has its, its, its uh, origins in, in European romanticism. There's Caspar Friedrich's Wanderer Above a Sea of Fog. Um, but that's what it really looks like. And you know, you re you're really kind of <laughs> gilding the lily when you paint it the way uh, in which Von Gerard did. I mean, Von Gerard is a great painting. It's a great painting. But you can see how it's substituting art for life. It's saying, well, we can't have what that, that won't do, so we'll have to create a kind of imaginary world that we can live in, a world of the arts, as though the arts can somehow transform nature. It's a strange thing that artists believe, that if you paint a picture in such a way, it'll somehow transform the way we perceive the world itself. Of course, it doesn't. You go back, you go to Mount Kosciuszko, it looks like that. You don't think, gee, it's just like Von Gerard, because it just ain't. Oh, yeah, here's Nicholas Chevalier's Buffalo Rangers in Victoria. You know, people say that they couldn't plant gum trees, these, uh, these middle people in the middle of the 19th century. That's absolute nonsense. Look at those gum trees, compare them with those. They look like gum trees, just like gum trees. What they couldn't get right was the landscape. Looks like Switzerland. Now, this painting, Buffalo Rangers, was the first Australian painting that was born, bought by the counterpart of this gallery in Victoria, the National Gallery of Victoria. And they thought it was a masterpiece. And it still hangs on the wall, they think it's terrific. Now why do they love it so much? Because it gives Australia a history. Because suddenly, you know, the old pioneering ways, well, the, the pioneering ways are old. See how the, the, the old, um, the old uh, bullock dray there looks a bit clapped out now. In fact, the bullocks look clapped out. They've sat down on the middle of the road. Uh, the little cottage is already in ruins and you can't see it because it's wiped out but here in the darkness there's actually a water wheel that's, um, that's broken. So it's creating a notion of, of ruins. It's, it, it's trying to give a kind of serenity and history to the past. I'm going to whiz through that too because I just don't have time to do this. Now, another response to this notion that the land is without nature, that the land is silent, that the land is full of death, 
comes from these people I call the water dreamers. And the chief among the water dreamers was Alfred Deacon, one of my heroes, actually, who was minister for water in Victoria in the, uh, in the 1880s and 1890s and then went on to become the dominant political figure in the Federation in the first 10 years of the 20th century. Deacon said this, don't say there are deserts in the middle of Australia. There are no deserts. They just look like deserts. But what's really out there is a garden. And we know it's a garden because on the rare occasion that it rains, all this stuff grows. And just imagine if we could be like the Romans, if we could bring hydroengineering to the heart of Australia and transform it, bringing life to the dead land. So the engineer at the end of the 19th century is not the opposite of nature, the way we think of it now. We think of engineering as an affront on nature now. At the end of the 19th century, the engineer is the liberator of nature, the man who will bring life to the place where life isn't. The desert's a big bowl of nothing. It's an absence which we will fill with life. And you start to get this great dream from America of the irrigation colonies which will transform Australia. And it's really important that we do this because by this stage, by 1910, having taken the land off the Aborigines but failed to occupy it ourselves, white Australians, we become fearful that though this is not Aboriginal Australia, it's white Australia, it is fearfully unoccupied and that the Asians will now come down and occupy it from us. And the fear actually is, at the turn of the century, that the Asians not are inferior but are superior, that they have these incredible ability to survive in places where we weaker whites can't. So we don't want that to happen, so we better irrigate so we can get in there and live before they take it off us. So irrigation becomes not just a matter of patriotic pride but a matter of defence. And so we get these great screams like the Idris plan. Eon Idris was the best-selling Australian writer in the middle of the uh, 20th century, to turn back the rivers. Now, the, you know, the Tully River up there where, where the floods have been, all that water going to waste, they said. Now, just imagine if you capture all that water that we've seen up there because of the cyclone, put it, c capture it in troughs. Those blue, the, I've, I've coloured this in. So those blue lines that are there, can I show you with a little arrow? Well, an arrow up here, yeah. Those blue lines that are there are troughs that have been basically dug along the Great Dividing Range. And the idea is the water comes along here, we catch these troughs and then carry the water through channels under the Great Dividing Range into the flatlands in Central Australia. And this is downhill all the way and you fill Lake Eyre with that water, thereby irrigating the whole of inland Australia. And the other person who came up with, with the same scheme, you probably know this, is Bradfield. Now, Bradfield had incredible credentials because Bradfield was the designer of the bridge. And he had the same idea that we would fill the inland of Australia with all that water. Now, I don't want to debate the merits of this, but, well, I will briefly. No, I won't debate, I'll just tell you why it's a crazy idea. No debate, it's a crazy idea. <laughs> and the reason it's crazy is because in central Australia, the water evaporation rate is absolutely fierce. That water will just go up into the sky. You want to use that water effectively where the good farming land is on the coast. So yes, we should irrigate, of course we should. We should use the water effectively to grow food in the good farming country. But don't put it in the middle of Australia because it'll just evaporate. I don't know whether you saw that fantastic thing on the ABC yesterday, about how, last night, about how the world was shaped by wind. There's, there's nothing to grow stuff in. All the great topsoil in Australia blew away thousands of years ago. The only stuff will grow there is stuff that's evolved over millions of years to grow in almost no soil at all. But the schemes went on. I love this one. This is the idea of turning... Lake Eyre into a great inland sea shaped like a heart. So the dead heart of Australia becomes a living, a living green heart. And of course, uh, that's one of the most famous images of all. I'm going to end by making this point. Um, what, what I've been wrestling with is the idea that in Australia, we've thought of nature as being absent. Now, these days, we don't use the word nature. Have you noticed that? It's gone out of fashion. We use the word the environment. I wonder why that is. Why has nature ceased to be a useful term for us in Australia? What does the environment give us? Well, it gives us a lot of things. It gives us the idea that there are systems there, that there are natural systems which work in certain ways, that there are ecosystems, that there are life forces and so on. And we can think of the Murray-Darling Basin, for example, as a series of environmental units that are 
connected in complex ways. It helps us do that. But it robs us of a notion of spirituality. It robs us of all the stuff I've been talking about earlier on, about nature as something that reaches out to us in our hearts, in our souls, that nurtures us in our spirits. We've lost something by trading off nature, but we've had to do that because you know, we're trying to come to grips with this and, and, and the environment is getting, uh, getting, it, getting us some way. Now, of course, one of the great things that, uh, one of the great movements that brought the environment into focus was the great wilderness movement in Tasmania, which of course is not dry, which is exceedingly wet, and which convinced us that we could think of the pristine parts of Australia, which of course are not pristine at all, they're filled with Aboriginal stories and Aboriginal interaction, that the great forest of Tasmania could be thought of as wilderness in a nice way, uh, and that we should leave nature untrammeled there. Now, my view is that we need to move beyond that. We need to believe that we can build and farm and live in nature. That locking up nature, that's fine. I have no problem with setting aside areas for uh, ecological value. Of course that's all right. But to surrender the idea that... Uh, we shouldn't surrender the idea that the farm itself is nature, that the city is nature, that Sydney is part of the natural environment. Sydney is as much nature as an anthill is nature or a rabbit warren is nature. We've got to understand that it's all environment, that every aspect of our lives is environment. And if we think about irrigation in those terms, just to take on one um, uh, issue, you'll see how ruinous it is to think of the plans to revive the Murray-Darling Basin as a struggle between nature and farming. You know, this battle between environmentalism and, and, and irrigation is not getting us anywhere. So that's one shift of definition which I'm hoping we'll come to, to understand that it's all environment. I believe that has a capacity deep down to transform our relationship with Australia and to advance our stewardship of this part of the world, to get us beyond that idea, to resolve that tension that nature is both here and not here, that we're surrounded both by nature and a great desolation, that in the end we can believe that we belong here and that nature is speaking to us and that we can all become, in the end, water dreamers. Thank you very much. <laughs>